Hoof and mouth disease is the scourge of the cattle industry and an outbreak can decimate herds very quickly. Therefore, when the disease hit one cattle area a few years ago, authorities clamped on a strict quarantine to isolate and control the problem. There was one rancher who was determined to save his animals. He carefully sprayed every building on his farm, every room of his house, and every vehicle on his property. He then moved all his animals into a carefully scrubbed and disinfected building, padlocked the door and restricted all contact with the outside world. No visitors were allowed on his property and he even went to the point of picking up his newspaper at the front gate with sterile gloves then baking it in the oven to kill any bacteria. Yet despite his desperate efforts, within three weeks some of his cows became ill and the entire herd had to be put down. As one health officer noted, the virus is transmitted through the air and you can't quarantine the wind. In our time, the winds of the me generation are blowing strong with a very strong and deadly virus. People are deciding right and wrong according to their own opinions. They say, if it's right for me, who are you to judge? I'm afraid that we have sunk almost to the level of the Israelites when in Judges chapter 17 and verse 6, the Bible says, in those days, every man did what was right in his own eyes. The other day, I was visiting with a man who told me he grew, grew up Catholic but didn't agree with some of the things the Pope did, so he quit. He said, you're a pastor. I said, yes. Yes, sir. He said, Baptist. I said, yes, sir. He said, I used to attend such and such Baptist church, but I got tired of that because their answer to everything was, well, the Bible says. In this church, at this place, it is my prayer that our basis for instruction will always be the Bible. That we will always be able to back up what we claim and what we teach with thus saith the Lord. If we don't base our instruction here on God's word, on what would we base it? The opinions of man, the changes with the wind. I can remember when women were told it was better for them to bottle feed their children than it was to nurse them. Well, science's opinion on that has changed. My grandmother had a job going to dairies, measuring the fat content of milk to make sure the farmers weren't adding water to it. And then we come up with low-fat milk, and now, that we're, now we're told that whole milk is actually better for you than low-fat milk. Remember when eggs were taken off the menu because of cholesterol? Now they're off the menu just because we can't afford them. <laughs> My friends, you and I are called to be a holy people, a holy priesthood, a city on a hill, a light to the world. We are called to live different lives. And we, can't, we cannot any more isolate ourselves from society than we can cow from that virus, but we can confront it with the truth and with the word of God. For that reason, we're going to look at what the Bible says about a topic that in our society has become very controversial. This morning on the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, I would like us to look at what the Bible says about life and about the value of human life. In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, God says to Jeremiah, I chose you. Before I formed you in the womb, I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. My friends, I want you to understand that people are special. Unique and different from every other created being in all of the world. People are special. And God has known us before birth. God said, 
Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Did it ever occur to you that God has known you forever? He knew you before your parents did and before they created the first sonogram. This past week, I became a great uncle again. Dusty and Maria's son, J.D., had a baby girl. Well, he didn't actually have it. And <laughs> in spite of what some political parties may tell you, he, he was involved in the process, and he was there when the baby was delivered, but he didn't actually have it. His wife, Christina, did. He was there at the birth of his daughter, and I'm a great uncle again, and Gladys is a so-so aunt again. <laughs> and you know, even before you were born, we know things as well. By the time a child has been in her mother's womb for seven weeks, her lips are sensitive to touch. By the time she's been growing ten weeks, she is sensitive the rest of her body to touch. And by seven months, she can recognize her mother's voice before she's even born. Let me tell you about someone very special to us. Her name is Melinda, my niece. Melinda was born 11 weeks, two and a half months premature. I still remember, I was on a state at the time, I still remember one of the first pictures I saw of her. She was resting in my brother Dusty's, uh, my brother Travis's hand. And his hand was bigger than she was. Two and a half months premature. But you know, in many states in our country, a child of that age can still be aborted. God knew you before you were born. And you are aware of some things as well. The unborn children are. We remember when Mary, pregnant with the baby Jesus, went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John the Baptist. That the then six-month-old baby John leapt in his mother's womb at the sound of Mary's approach. God knew you before you were born. And we know things as well. Second, we know that God made us in his image. Look with me, if you will, please. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Genesis chapter 1. In verse 27, right there at the beginning of your Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God made us in his image. If you go and look at the rest of the creation account, you'll find that every time God made something, he spoke and it came into being. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, uh, separate the waters from the dry ground, and they were separated. And God said, let the, let the waters be teeming with life, and all of a sudden there are fish all over the place. And let the air be filled with birds, and all of a sudden the, the air is filled with birds. Every time... God made something, he spoke it into existence until God went to make man. And when he went to make man, God said, let us make man in our image. And the Bible tells us that God created us with his hands. He took dust from the ground and formed us with his own hands. And then with his own lips, he breathed into us. The breath of life. Nothing else he created did he do that to. But he said, man is my special creation. Created in my image. I form him with my own hands and breathe the breath of life into his lungs. And God later, knowing that man needed help, took a rib from Adam's side. And from that rib formed the first woman, Eve. 
And Eve was formed and created like Adam was in the image of God. I want you to know that God created us even with the defects that we have. Some people have the mistaken idea that if a baby is going to be born deformed or handicapped or in some way different, that that baby or person's life is somehow worth less. Listen to what the psalmist says. In Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13, we read, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I am unique in remarkable ways. Psalm 119, verse 73, Thy hands made me and fashioned me. Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? You know that song we sang earlier, I can only imagine. It first came out, I didn't care much for it. It felt kind of bubblegumish to me. Until I went to a friend of mine's job, and he is a videographer. And he had taken um, some video clips from some missionaries working with uh, blind and deaf children in Russia. And he took video clips of these blind and deaf children in this home. And he put that song to it. I can only imagine. And I can't listen to that song anymore without thinking about those children and crying and thinking how great it will be for them in heaven when the defects and disabilities that they are born with no longer exist. But just because there are issues in a person's life does not mean their life is without value. Remember in John chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, when the disciples asked Jesus about the blind man, Who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus answered, Neither this man sinned nor his parents. Jesus answered, This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. Even those with defects and disabilities created in the image of God. According to God's unique plan, design, and purpose. And speaking of which, God made us all for a purpose. Look with me, please. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. <clears throat> For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. God made you, he made all mankind for a purpose. Even before we were born, God had laid down a purpose for our lives, for yours and mine. He made us exactly the way we are, formed us in our mother so that we can accomplish the plans he has for us. Do you realize that God made you just the way you are for a reason? There are people you can reach. There are people you can minister to. There are people that you can help that none of the rest of us can minister to, help, or reach. Because God specifically made, created, designed you, and placed you in a position to complete His works. Every person, even while in the womb, has been formed by God, is known by God, is created in the image of God, and has a purpose in God's plans. People are special. The second, I want you to understand that God hates killing. Next is chapter 20. In verse 13, we read, Thou shalt not murder. Do you remember the account of David and Bathsheba recorded in 2 Samuel? King David was attracted to a woman he saw bathing next door, so he slept with her, even though she was married, and she became pregnant. David had her husband killed, and God got ticked, and David and his family paid a terrible price for David's sin. Now, David had that woman's husband killed to cover his sin, 
to escape embarrassment, to get on with his life, to get out of a bad situation. In spite of his many reasons, God did not accept any of them. My friends, those are the same reasons, the same excuses many people give today to have an abortion. Either they're afraid, or they'll be embarrassed, or they'll be inconvenienced, or it will be bring trauma and drama into their lives. Those are never valid reasons for taking another's life. There was a time before sonograms and such when people might have argued that the child doesn't know or is just a mass of cells. These days we know differently. By the end of two months, we now know a child is fully formed. He has all of his fingers and all of his toes. They can tell the sex of a child. All that baby needs is more cooking time. We no longer have an excuse for killing our children and saying that we did not know. Because now we know. And my friends, Christians must respond. Sadly, many who claim to be Christians support, endorse, and excuse abortion. In February of 2011, a black minister from Texas had a billboard erected in New York City which showed a young black girl in a pink dress and the words, the most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb. That was in response to the high rate of abortions in New York City, particularly among black women. A recent report by the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene said that the abortion rate in 2009 was 41 percent. The rate among black women was 59.8 percent. Today, there are more black children aborted in the city of New York than there are born alive. Life. Always, the ministry that had the sign erected compared abortion to genocide. Bill de Blasio called for the billboard's immediate removal. Christine C. Quinn, Speaker of the City Council, issued a statement saying, To refer to a woman's legal right to an abortion as a genocidal plot is not only absurd, but it is offensive to women and to communities of color. The advertising company that removed the billboard removed the billboard after employees of a Mexican restaurant under the sign received numerous complaints. A protest march was scheduled to take place there, led by Reverend Al Sharpton. Reverend, are you kidding me? My friends, we can no longer sit on the fence saying it's none of our business. We can no longer sit silently and say nothing. Already, abortion has claimed the lives of 40 million innocent victims here in the United States since it was legalized here. That's more than have been killed in all of America's wars. Today, one out of four women in America either have had or will have an abortion. Every day, there are more babies killed in abortion clinics that were than were killed in the Twin Towers on September 11th. We cannot sit idle. Roe versus Wade has been overturned on the federal level, but that is a battle which must be won in every state as well, including in ours. And so what is the Christian response to this murder going on in our country? Number one, ask forgiveness. If you have had an abortion, ask God to forgive you. First John chapter 1, verse 9, we read, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My friend, there is none of us without sin. All of us have made poor decisions, have chosen to do things contrary to God's will. He will forgive you if you ask him. And after you let him forgive you, forgive yourself. There is no way that you can hold standards higher than his. And Jesus said, if you confess your sins, that those sins are taken away, that they are washed in the sight of God. You have on the purity, the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, God has placed them behind his back to see them 
no more. Ask for forgiveness and acceptance. And accept it. And second, love others. James chapter 2 verse 10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Many Christians look down their self-righteous noses at those who have had abortions. And James says God doesn't grade our sins. If you're human, then you've sinned. So quit acting like you didn't need Jesus to die for your sins and begin loving people the way Jesus did. When the woman called in adultery was brought to Jesus, did he overlook it? Did he deny it? No. He said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And then he looked at the woman and he said, you can go back to doing what you're doing. No, that's not what he said. He said, go and sin no more. You see, we love people and we accept people. But we tell them the truth. We tell them what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says there are certain things that are sins. We're guilty of many of them. But we do not smile and say, God forgives you, go on doing whatever you want to do. Because Jesus never did that. Jesus said, I love you. Go and sin no more. And we must do the same. We love those that Jesus gave his life for. But then we tell them the truth. Don't do it anymore. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Third, we pray for change. God works miracles in response to the prayers of his people. We saw that this past year when he overturned Roe vs. Wade at the federal level. We pray for change can't believe that they recently shot down a bill that would require medical care being given to a child they attempted to abort who was born alive. And some of the Congress people were celebrating that that bill was shot down. What kind of sick society have we become? That we are excited, we celebrate the fact that we can leave our children born alive to lay there and die. We pray for change. And fourth, we work for change. In the United States, you can be fined $5,000 and imprisoned for up to a year for breaking an eagle's egg. You can be imprisoned and fined for stealing a sea turtle egg. And yet our babies are being killed daily with little outcry. It is time we contact our legislators and tell them there must be a change. This is unacceptable. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 9 says that a leader has the responsibility to speak out for the one who cannot speak. For the rights of those who are doomed. My friends, you and I have a responsibility to support those who speak out for and defend those who are unable to speak for themselves. For our, for our children. When I was born, I was a blue baby. My lungs were not working properly. My heart had a problem with a valve as well. They didn't let my mom see me for three days because they said I'd never live. They said I would not live 10 hours. My parents were dirt poor, living in poverty in a small camper, barely large enough for the two of them. The last thing in the world they needed was a sickly baby. And yet they spared me. Help others do the same. Let us pray.